powerful. I worship you. That's why we come. Amen? So good to see you. Good morning, church. I was prepared to come into the pulpit and say I am 95% back vocally, but I just blew out my voice singing because <laughs> we have the greatest worship team on the planet, and uh, I don't regret nothing. Yeah, you give the Lord the praise and thank the band. They work hard. They get up awfully early. You don't see that. They work hard, and they take it very, very seriously, the fact that they help usher us to the throne room of God, and that's awesome. And what we got, guys, here is rare. It is precious. I hope you appreciate it like, like I do as well. I'm going to show a picture in just a second, okay? It's going to be startling. It's going to be graphic. I want to prepare you because the frightening part is you're going to find yourself in this picture, okay? I think you'll be safe. It's a little PG rated. Just want to get a little parental guidance. I'm going to show it in three, two, one. Which one of these are you? <laughs> See, we've been talking about reigniting. You know, what happens when we lose our passion? And why do we lose our passion? What is it that robs us of that? And I think yeah, most of us, we're somewhere in here. You know, we're not so much here and not so much here, but we're kind of here-ish. This, for this, okay. Pointing it, keep going. Here? Hopefully not too many are here. <laughs> Check your pulse. I mean, if you are here and you're here, God bless you. That's awesome. You came to the right place. Because there are days where I'm, I'm closer to that than I want to be. And I'm farther from that than I ought to be. Anyone else? Anyone else feel like that? Yeah? Whew. Six honest people. Thank you for nodding your head. I appreciate that. Why do we do that? This series has all been leading up to today. Today we're going to look at the number one reason why we flame out. The number one. It has all been pointing to this moment. In fact, today is, is not just a reason. It is probably the biggest reason why people burn out, why we lose our passion. And I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I want to see if you can guess what it is based on the scripture we're going to read, based on God's word. So if you're ready and I've piqued your interest, open your Bible, Genesis 2. If you're new to the faith, that's the front of your book. Go all the way there to the far left and come back two chapters. We're going to look at Genesis 2. I'm actually going to read from the King James Version today if you're following along at home digitally. Wonders never cease. We're going to look at the King James Version and uh, just let God's Word speak to you today. It is so, so powerful. So God, up to this point, has been working hard for six days to create everything that we see. And that's where we pick up the story, starting in chapter 2, verse 1. Read with me. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all of the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested. Say that word with me. Rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it. He set it apart as holy. He, he, he sanctified it. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So there it is. Did you catch it? Did you catch the one thing? The main reason why we burn out and why we lose our passion is because we don't know how to truly rest, especially in our country, because we are so blessed. We are so fat, happy, and content, like a, like a, a hound dog on the front porch. You just want to scratch his hole. We're so blessed. And we know, sorry, I can't help but kick the leg. I don't know what that is, but hopefully that's a dog thing. And we are so blessed. God worked and he worked hard and we're meant to work and work hard. Nothing wrong with that. But then God rested and he rested hard. And we are meant to rest hard in him. Everybody okay with that? Everybody okay with that? Yeah? It's just, it's so, it's the, after completing the cosmos, he did something unthinkable. He paused and he rested. Was he tired? He was modeling that for his creation. He was saying, I am going to do this. I'm going to set it apart. It's called a Sabbath. That word comes from a Hebrew word, which literally means to cease. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> Jazz hands. To cease. To stop your labor. To stop all of your striving. Stop working. It is a glorious, full 24 hours, not 8, not 12, 24 hours that is holy and separate from our crazy existence everywhere else, from our chaotic lives, from that endless striving and ceasing and sweating and stressing and fretting. 
It is supposed to be a clear delineation, a mark separating it. That's what being holy is and sanctified. It means to come out. It was the climax of God's work week. And it's supposed to be the climax of yours. So you know I got to ask, how you doing with that? Because if I'm just being transparent, and you know I like to be embarrassingly transparent, I fail at this more than I get it right. So you recognize these verses, and we think, oh, it's the Ten Commandments, right? You know, we see it in Exodus, it's rephrased again in Deuteronomy, and it's supposed to stop, it's Fourth Commandment, it's great, and it is, but it is so much more than that. In fact, this is God's mandate to us, but it's one of the few that comes with a blessing. We can do this. The good news is, if you're failing at this, we can change that. You have the power. I have the power. We can all choose to do this. The question is, will we? 1980s He-Man reference, check. We have the power. All the way from Genesis through the New Testament, Jesus arrives on the scene and he endorses this so powerfully. But here's the problem. He endorses it in a way that we have memorized in a particular translation and it rolls off our tongue. Something about take my burden, my yoke's easy, it's light, and I won't give you more than you can. And we think, yeah, oh, I know that, Pastor, that's good, I'm, I'm fine, just move on. No, those words no longer move us because they're so familiar to us. So today I want to change it up, and I want to see the other scripture that goes hand in hand with the Old Testament, New Testament, where Jesus comes and he fulfills the law, he doesn't abolish it, he fulfills the law, and he paraphrases it beautifully in the message translation. Look at it with me. It says this, are you tired? Worn out, burned out on religion? And I can say, yes, yes, yes. Look at these next three words. Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I will show you how to take a fake rest. No? Real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I love that. You'll learn to live freely and lightly. Anybody want to do that? Isn't that amazing? That's so awesome. When he says, come to me, do you know that in the original Greek, that's an imperative? It's actually a, a, almost a declaration. It, it means, come now. It means I see how busy you're going to be. I look into the future. I see what 2020 is going to be for my children that I love so dearly, and I want them to come away. You must come now. Stop it. He told the disciples that when they had been out burning the candle at both ends. They were so frantic. We talked about this on Wednesday night a couple weeks ago. He said, stop, stop. Tell me all your stories, but come away with me to a lonely place. You haven't even eaten. Get alone with me and rest. Jesus called a holy time out. That's what God does for us. Yeah, we blow it off like, ha, ah. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. What are we thinking? This is a gift from God. And it sounds so easy and it's so simplistic, but make no mistake about it. Keeping the command to honor the Lord with a day of rest is radical today. And it is extremely hard unless you are intentional. I mean, it is, this is something that if we're honest, we look at it, we think that's a nice option. I like those commandments. Those Ten Commandments are really cool. The Ten Suggestions are fantastic. Right? We don't say it with our lips, but we say it with our life, the way we do this. Like everything else, I was looking at this, and I was thinking, you know what? That's a good thing. I'm going to do that. When I get everything else caught up in my life, I'm going to rest. I'm going to honor. That's a lie, because you are never caught up. Right? As long as you are alive, you will never be caught up. As one writer put it, we are living in a fallen world, and it's just like walking in a blizzard. And somebody throws you a lifeline. There's a, there's a movie that came out years ago, I think we got a picture of it, where Kate Beckinsale's lost, she's down in the, in the uh, I think the Antarctic, and they say, you better hold on to the rope. If you let go of the rope, I say, I'm not, I don't need to hold on to the rope, I'm just going to go down these steps, and I'm going to that house over there, the bathhouse. If you let go of the rope and a whiteout comes, you'll get lost, and we'll never see you again. Come, how ridiculous is that? And they say, you need to hold on to the rope. This blizzard is coming. We have whiteout conditions that will come up like that, and you will get lost. You know what happens? People get comfortable in the blizzard, and they say, I'm used to this. And they let go of the rope because they think they know better. They think they know where they're going, and guess what happens? Every single year, people let go of the rope, the whiteout comes, and they find them dead. Sometimes not five feet from their destination. 
five feet. It's a tragedy. They were right there, but they got so turned around and they got lost and they started to panic and they thought they were going the right way and they were actually getting further away and they almost made it back. But by then, frostbite and everything had hypothermia set in. And God shows up and he says, I am going to give you a rope. It's not a commandment only. It is a gift. Hold on to this. This is your life. Y'all, we should be jumping to hold this rope that God offers us. I think one of the reasons we fail to rest is because we think it's optional. I mean, we got this. I'm strong. I'm young-ish. <laughs> we, can, we can do this, right? I got, I got this. I got this. Little by little, we're grinding down. And one day we look up and we're a shadow of what God wanted us to be. You know why? Because we thought we knew better. We thought this was optional. Y'all, think about this. We look at the Lord. He says, here's this gift I give you. And we look up. We say, ah, thanks, but no thanks. I, I, I got it. I'm okay. I, I, I still got gas in the tank. I can do. I know my plan. But listen, God, if you need a rest, you can take one. <laughs> Are you tired, God? Because I'm okay. Come on. This is what we say with our lifestyle. See, we, we, we might think we take a day off. That's not a Sabbath rest. You, you understand? That is a cheap counterfeit. But God comes and, hey, just like the Jews in Egypt, for 400 years, they never had a single day off. They didn't know. They didn't know the natural balance of rhythm and work and rest and play. And it was so ingrained in them that they were nothing more than just tools for production. They were slaves. You will work, and you will work seven days a week, and you will never have a rest. And they did this for generations. So when God finally delivered them, it was almost as if he whispered to them and says, listen, you are made in my image, and you are not a cog in a machine. You are not meant to work endlessly seven days a week without coming and getting away by yourselves. And I know it's going to feel awkward for a little bit, but you are made special in my image, and I created you to live according to a certain design, and you're not doing it. So I'm going to bless you with a gift that you know you need. Just like the ancient Israelites, here we are, guys, we have been called out. We don't have to prove to the world our worth. We don't have to prove our value by what we do, by the junk and the clutter we possess. God shows up and he says, you are deeply loved simply for who you are. You don't have to do anything. It's not about what you do. Last week, we got to host the pastor's conference here. Mm -mm -mm. Thursday was awesome. The place was filled with pastors, representing over probably 45,000 people. And they were all sitting through here, and it was amazing. Thank you to all of you who cooked and made things and came and cleaned and steam cleaned and painted. It was phenomenal. I was so proud of you, so proud of this church. And there were people here at the altar weeping, pastors, who were this close to burning out. In fact, every single person here was given a book. One pastor said, this is so important that you get this, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. I bought one for all of you, for everyone. This is what the pastor did, his own dime. And he gave it to every one of us. And I thank Linda. She took this and she, she transcribed like four whole points for this for me so I could share some of the highlights of some of the most powerful stuff and I'm going to share these four biblical steps with us. How do we observe and protect the day of rest to where it's not something cheap? It's not a counterfeit. It's the real thing. It's more than a day off. Because if we're being honest, one of the dangers of faithfully observing a day of rest is falling into legalism. Just another burdensome thing to do. And y'all, I want nothing to do with that. I got enough on my to-do list. I'm looking for things to come off my plate. Anybody else like me? I mean, what do we do? How do we even do this? Is it an Old Testament thing? Or is it like, do we need to go back to Saturday? Do we need to shave half our must be Amish? What, what do we do? Do we need to, can it be a Sunday? Can it be a, a different day? What do we do? What about those who work on Sundays who have to, like pastors or policemen or first responders and nurses? What do they do? Thankfully, Jesus answered that. In Mark 2, 27, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What might work for somebody might not work for another person. Jesus preached a lot of sermons on Sunday. He healed a lot of people on Sunday. Sometimes Jesus worked, and he rested on a different time. The key is to make a day of rest every seven days, a 24-hour block of time that is for you and your replenishment and your time with God and your time with family and, yes, your time to play and enjoy life. 
This is one of the things that, that we get, mis- even the Apostle Paul over in Romans seemed to think one day would do as well as another. The important part was to select a period of time holy and separate to the Lord and honor him and protect it. So today I want to share these, these four foundations, okay? Then I'm going to separate what is a secular day off, which no doubt can produce some benefits, no, no denying it, but a real Sabbath, see a secular Sabbath leaves out the Creator, And if we do that, then it's just a day off. It's self-indulgent. It is a counterfeit Sabbath, a cheap imitation of what it's meant to be. I don't know about you. When I grew up hearing the word Sabbath, well, first I thought the the band Black Sabbath. Anybody else think that? And I was like, well, that can't be good. I don't want that. And then I started thinking, what do we do? What do we not do? Do we all have to become Amish like for a day and sit in a dark room and light a candle? (laughs) We have a crust of dry bread and I'll be spiritual, so I'll talk in hushed tones. If I'm really spiritual, I might use sign language or something. I don't know. I didn't know, I didn't know what it meant. Do we need to speak in Latin? In the Gregorian chant, I'm getting hungry. And be honest. You don't know what a Sabbath is either. You start thinking about it. So I want to leave us with four simple things to demystify what this day of rest looks like in the modern age. The first one, the most important one. By the way, none of them involve having to grow an Amish beard. The first step is this. Stop. Stop. I think you can all write that note down. This is it. Remember last week, stop and drop? Drop your worries in the worry box. Remember that? This goes further. Honoring God with your day of rest, first and foremost, means you must stop. It involves stopping. It's built literally into the meaning of the Hebrew word Shabbat, the Sabbath. But our problem is we don't know how to stop because we say, I'm going to stop when I get caught up. I'm going to stop when I'm done. Whatever project I'm done, Pastor, you don't understand. I got to finish this paper. Pastor, you don't understand, I've got one more meeting I've got to do, and then I'm going to take a break. I've got to do these emails, these voicemails, I've got to pay the bills, I haven't cleaned the house. There's always one more goal that I've got to reach before I stop. And we deceive ourselves thinking, maybe I'll stop and rest when I get caught up, or when my kids are grown and out. Then I'm going to slow down and I'm going to rest. I'm going to really start to... When I retire, I'm finally going to... When I'm 97, I mean it, I'm going to take a, a, a biblical rest. Y'all, that's a lie. You know why? Because there's always something more to be done. Life on this side of heaven is an unfinished symphony. It is something that will never be done. And the sooner you can grasp this truth, the sooner you can get to living lightly and freely, like he said. But if we're confronted with a new challenge every day, y'all, that's okay. You are going to die with unfinished goals. Do you know that? That's okay. You are not meant to. God has things in control. He can run the world even if you stop and relax for 24 hours. When we practice the scriptures to be still and know that he is God and stop worrying. The core issue about stopping, let's be honest, I'm not holding back. It's an issue of trust. Do you believe if you stop for 24 hours that God will supernaturally bless you and make up for that day of rest through the other six days? Do you honestly believe that? Because he did that for, for ancient Israel. In fact, he did sabbatical years where they would rest for a seventh year. And on that seventh year, he would make it up on that sixth year so that you could rest and let the ground rest and the farmland recover and replenish and lie dormant. You want to talk about a matter of trust when you're not making food anymore. And God says, I will provide if you trust me. We only have to do this on six days. Think about this. Y'all, anybody remember the great old video game, Oregon Trail. Did anybody play that? Raise your hand if you played that. Yeah. Oh, isn't it great? You're in your little covered wagon and you're heading to Oregon. You got to make it. You know, you're like the late 1800s. You're like, tick, 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 going west and you're having a good time. And then, bam, you get a sign that says, Karen has diphtheria. Oh, no. Karen's got diphtheria. Well, that's okay. Karen will get it. We'll, we'll just keep going. Just boom. Kevin now has a broken leg. Like, oh, poor Kevin. Well, hobble along, Kevin. Let's keep going. We got to keep going, right? You plow ahead, and then you get the real wake-up calls. Bam! You have dysentery. <laughs> and you like, you go to your dictionary because you don't know what that word means. Like, oh. <laughs> 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 Y'all, I want that. <laughs> oh. But what do you do? You don't listen to your body. You press on. And then you get this warning sign that says, you have died of dysentery. <laughs> oh, you pushed it. <laughs> you didn't have any Pepto. 
no keo pekte. And you pushed it. Yeah. Y'all, this is, there's a famous true story of Christians who did just this, who actually left St. Louis in a wagon train and went to Oregon back in the frontier days. And they were going and going, and it was late fall, and they started getting nervous because they knew the snows were coming in the mountains of Oregon. And they started to panic. And a fight rose out. And half the group of practicing Christians who were observing this day of rest said, we're gonna, we, we got to rest. We cannot keep the hammer down. And the other group said, we can't afford to rest. I'm going somewhere with this. We can't afford to rest. We're going to fall too far behind. Let's put the hammer down, and we're going to travel all seven days wide open to try to get there before the snow comes and kills us. They couldn't come to a resolution, so they divided the camp, and they said, those who want to go on and press and go seven days a week, full bore, hardcore, all out, go. And those who want to continue to trust God and honor him and his word and trust that he will provide and get us there safely, stay with us. So they split. Guess what happened? Guess who got there first? The people who observed God's day of rest. Do you know why? Let this sink in. Because they trusted in their creator, who knows better, they were so well rested and their horses were so well rested that they didn't even realize they were traveling so much farther the other six days and supernaturally getting things done that they beat and passed the ones who trudged straight through and plowed through God's stop sign. Sound familiar? Y'all, we do this every time. And there it is. When I trust God and take him at his word and obey his commandments, he provides. God is not a liar. He provides. So what do we do? We've demystified the first step. We stop. We cease our labor. The second thing we do, it's tricky. We rest. <laughs> Duh, right? Imagine that. We rest. Once we stop, the Sabbath calls us, no, invites us to rest. God rested after his work, and we are supposed to do the same. So what do we do? What, what do we do now that we're stopping? I mean, the answer is simple. You do whatever is restful, whatever is restoring to you, whatever is replenishing to your body, yes, to your mind, woohoo, and to your spirit. See, we leave that out. That's why this is not a secular day off. That's what Satan wants to distort this and rob you of the true spiritual heritage you have as a son and daughter of the king. This is where the supernatural comes in. Now, people say, well, I have to cease my work. I don't understand. All right, here's what you do. Here's a step. Find out what work is to you and don't do it. Stop. I have to do this. It involves putting down the iPhone. See, work follows you today. Used to be you go in, you punch in, nine to five, boom, boom, come home, and you left it there. Now it follows you because you got a smartphone. And those lines have been blurred, and you don't know when to quit. And you have 24-hour access to anything you need, so you're never done. No, you can't do it. My wife, my daughter, they have permission. They see me grab that, I took, stop that. Put that down, Egon. You don't need that. This is your time to rest. So I want to say something. And you know what? This is probably the most important thing I will say in the whole sermon. So you can tune out literally after this next sentence. Are you ready for this? Your day of rest is not a catch-up day. I'll let that ruminate for just a second. If this is what we do on our Sabbath, get caught up on things that are never done, we have blown it, we have missed it, that is not what God gave us. It is a day of rest, holy and separate, to delineate from the rest of your chaos. Keep that crud in your other six days. But this day is for you and the Lord and your family if you have one. It is not a catch-up day. If you do that, your work is never done. Y'all, anybody play Monopoly growing up? Great game, right? You ever remember when you got this card, like, woo, get out of jail free? Love it. God is giving you a get-out-of-work free card. And some of us say, nah, I'm good. What are we doing? Why, we're so, what are we doing? We think we know more than our creator. He's saying, you need this. You haven't burned. Yeah, we are not human doings. We are human beings. 
We're not meant to just be these machines like the ancient slaves in Israel where they just work seven days. And sadly, some of us will not get this until a physical illness stops us or a heart attack or depression or some wave of flu comes. We don't serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath serves us. It is a blessing. It's a gift. Accept it. The third step, the next thing we do is we delight. Well, now we're getting good. Now we're getting good, Pastor. The third component to a biblical day of rest revolves around delighting in what we have been given because God is so good. He is so faithful. God did this. After finishing his work of creation, he proclaimed, not that it's good, he proclaimed that it was very good. And he delighted over his creation. The Hebrew word used here literally implies joy of a completed or some wonder or, yes, even play. It's almost a playful delight. You know, this is so foreign to us today. This is such a radical concept to see people who actually honor a 24 hours day of this. Time out. You look like a freak if you try this, right? Let that freak flag wave. What's that saying? Whatever. This is your time to say, I am not going to be one of those delight deficient people. I am a child of the king and he has given me permission to take a day off. You don't need a note from your boss. You don't need a note from your pastor. You've got a note from God, your creator, to honor this and say, I am sorry. I am going to stop and enjoy and delight in the creation and all its gifts. I am going to slow down. I'm going to pay attention to the birds singing. I'm going to pay attention to the food I eat, the smells and the scents, and I'm going to build margin into my day so I'm not a spaz running to and fro that nobody wants to be around anyway. You know who's great at this? Jennifer Forrest stop and smell the, the beauty and appreciate the flowers. She has these blogs that she'll put out on Facebook. It says, it's a picture of stuff. It could be a, like a squirrel caught in the sun and a rainbow or something. And she's just like, <laughs> hashtag, I see you, God. So cool. Or it could be some heart-shaped thing in a bark and tree that we would walk by in a blur. She goes, God is sending me a sign saying, I love you. Hashtag, I see you, God. How cool is that? You don't think that makes your Heavenly Father proud? Do you, do you get happy when your kid comes and says, Dad, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Like, that was just a small thing. But you're welcome. <laughs> Come give me a hug. <laughs> I'm not crying. You're crying. Right? This is, this is, I will never forget the time I was on a mission trip overseas in communist-controlled Czechoslovakia. This is done during the brutal, atheistic, communistic reign of Ceausescu. Anybody remember him before the Iron Curtain collapsed? It was awful. You want to talk about a people who are so oppressed? They were I saw firsthand what communism and atheistic socialism will do to a country and to a people who are once proud. It was horrible. The poverty, the hunger. And while we were over there, the hunger we had. We hadn't eaten a good meal in forever. Y'all, I could not wait to get back home. Simply to smell and eat a greasy double cheeseburger from McDonald's. We would lie in bed at night talking, what do you want to look, what do you look forward to the most? Hot shower, cheeseburger. Those are my two. Hot shower. When I came over the hill for the first time and I saw those heavenly golden arches, <laughs> I thought it was the golden gates of glory. And, I came, and when I ate that greasy cheeseburger and that hot shower, oh, it washed. I had hair then, and it just came, and it was, I was just like, oh. I think I stayed in there for like 65 minutes. Washed. It was, yeah, anybody ever had something? No, just me? All right, I'm a nerd, whatever. It was those little things that I delighted in. Y'all, think about this. Every seven days, God invites you to slow down and pay attention and delight in him. And Satan says, you don't need to do that. Stop. Just take a couple hours off. Get back on the grind. Work a little harder. We were made to originally enjoy God. That is our perfect. In fact, the Westminster Catechism says this. The chief end of man, the whole point is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. How are you doing with that? When your neighbors see you, do they see a child of the king who serves a God who lets them rest? Or do they see someone serving a God who burns them out? And there's no difference between them and us. And we think, hey, don't you want to be like me and have what I have? And they say, no, I don't. You're just as fried and frantic as me. 
It's not supposed to be that way. Which leads us to the last one, the most important step, contemplate. Mm. The final and most important quality of a biblical Sabbath is contemplation of God. The Sabbath is always, Exodus 31, holy unto the Lord, where we stop and we ponder. This is what separates us from being uh, what, what's been called the bastardization of the Sabbath, where we make it into a secular day off, where they remove the Creator. We stop and we bring Him in and we keep God the central focus of our day of rest. The Jewish people and Christian all throughout history have included worship with God's people on this day. If Sunday is your day of Sabbath, congratulations, you've already conquered about two to three hours of your Sabbath day where you have gotten with him and you have kept him first and foremost, where you can bask in his glorious presence, where we participate in the reading and the study of his scripture. We enjoy the rare power and majesty of worshiping God and also sitting in silence, being still, and know that he is God. Every Sabbath is just a taste of the glorious eternal celebration that's coming of worship and celebration and food. You know there's going to be food? Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Oh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a lot better than that double cheeseburger from McDonald's. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot better. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Just a taste. When, when we see him face to face and we see just how short our earthly life was and we put it in proper perspective, your Sabbath day helps you do that. Helps you pull back and get a better view and go, why am I so stressed over this, this, and this? And it didn't even matter. And you come back and you get a holy perspective where you can be with him for a few minutes or hours on your day of rest with him and feast on his perfect presence. Catch a glimpse of his splendor and his greatness and his majesty and his perfection and his love. Sit in Abba, Father's lap. We don't do it. What is wrong with us? This should be the one thing that we should be saying, oh, I think you're Sabbathing a little too much now. Instead, we got to talk about it and encourage each other to follow God's command to stop and come away with me. I see what the world's doing to you. You need to be with me. I want you to get your family, and I want you to pray about some things that you could do together. I want you to pick out a game. I want you to pick out an inspiring movie to watch. I want you to pick out some music to listen to. I want you to get a great book. And I want you to just rest. Cease your striving and your work and just get with God because your to-do list is never going to be done. So to do this, some practical tips, you're going to need to prepare a couple things. The Jews had an entire day of preparation for this. I'm not advocating for that. Devout Jews, they will literally go into their bathroom and tear squares of toilet paper and stack them on things so that they don't even have to tear toilet paper because they feel like that's violating stuff. That is a burdensome command to me, and I don't think that misses, that, that misses to me what God is giving you this day for. That would be serving the Sabbath. The Sabbath is meant to serve you. It's supposed to be a gift and a blessing. There's no strings attached to it. It's just a gift. So you prepare. You think ahead. We do this. In my home, we think, okay, Sunday's going to be our Sabbath. Sometimes I have to take a Saturday or a Friday Sabbath because Sundays are tough. You may have to do that. Whatever day it is, get with your kids. Pick out their clothes, man. Make, take some preparation. Have their food laid out. I walked by upstairs. Milo had his whole outfit rolled out laying on the floor. What's that? That's for church. Set their Bible out. Hopefully you're teaching them about an offering. Have their offering ready. Are they earning? Are they getting an allowance? Are you showing them a tenth is holy unto the Lord and he allows us to keep 90% for ourselves? I hope you're teaching that, Mom, Dad. Hopefully you're modeling that because the same principle applies here. Do you trust God with your day? Do you trust him with what he provides you? It's a Sabbath. Take that time, plan. Think. Y'all remember four or five years ago I preached a message called Snow Day? Anybody remember that? where I went just into the fourth commandment and I talked the whole time about that. And then two years ago, we actually had a snow day on a Sunday and we couldn't come. And I think Jason or Tion was kind enough to go find that sermon and do a little clip and put it out on that Sunday morning and say, hey, we can't have church, but I want you to look at this snow day thing. If you weren't here for that or you missed it, a snow day is simply this. You're a kid and you're home and you wake up and glory of glories, there's holy white stuff all over the road the roads are impassable, the schools are closed, work is done, and you, bam, have 24 hours of bliss. To nap, 
to read a book, to sit by the fire, to play Monopoly, do whatever you want. That's what a Sabbath is. A Sabbath is like a holy snow day where you get to come. God gives you one every seven days, church. Think about this. You know what that is? I did the math. That's 52 snow days a year. Seven weeks? Are you kidding? Where we can practice stopping, resting, delighting, and contemplating for a 24-hour period each week. Guess what happens? Your other six days become so infused with passion and wisdom and perspective that you get far more done than you thought because God honored his word and you were able to protect that because you showed, I'm going to trust you. So here's what we're going to do. Jason, I'm going to have you come up just by yourself. I'm going to pray for you guys. I'm going to share. I'm not done, but I want to share a couple things here. If you really want to go deeper, if you really want to see longevity in your life, God did something special for Israel. In addition, he knew if they were ever going to rise to their full potential, that they would need even longer periods of rest than 24 hours. They would need even longer times of restoration, longer stretches to rest and delight and contemplate. And for this reason, that's why God built into their economic and political life sabbatical years, where God commanded Israel to give the land a Sabbath rest one out of every seven years. But again, he knew this would require great faith because that sixth year, he would double it up to get them through the seventh. They were to trust God for his provision. Peter Scazzaro, the guy who wrote that great book, said that sometimes he will take one or two of his weeks vacation, or three if he can get them all together, and he tries to pour some of his Sabbath ideas into this. He gathers his family, and he lets his kids help decide, what do you want to do that we can build rest into this, that we can build our Heavenly Father into this? What can we do so that we're not blowing all our resources on constant frantic, you gotta go, gotta do this, to where you come home from your vacation and you need another vacation? Oh, I see a lot of heads nodding. You ever been there? And I'm so worn out, I come back in. How was your trip? It was awesome. <laughs> I just, so, Elliot, you're preaching. I can't, my feet are killing me. I love Universal, it's awesome. We're going back sometime. (laughs) Got to drop 15 more pounds so my feet and my back don't hurt, but I need a vacation sometimes when I come back from my vacation. Peter Scazzaro says, don't do that. You'll get a bonus when you return from these kind of sabbaticals and you're on fire. Peter Scazzaro's wife encouraged her husband to do this as a pastor. It was the last thing Diane Rumley said to me, by the way, before she and Steve moved to Myrtle Beach, was, when are you taking your sabbatical? I've been serving 30 years this year, uninterrupted. Five years as pastor, five years with Jason. Leadership team asked me frequently, when are you going to get away and let your spiritual ground lie fallow? When are you going to take some uninterrupted, one month, two months, whatever it takes, just like a missionary, when you come home and you have two or three months to recover your vitality? Some of you need to do that. From church? (laughs) I'm not saying disappear from church. But you know what? If you've been serving, let me say this to church workers. If you've been serving relentlessly for seven years, maybe you need to take a break and just enjoy some Sabbath where you come and you sit and soak. Why? Pastor Matt lost his mind. Pastors don't say that. They say the opposite. We need more service. No, you know what? If you've been serving hard, follow God's instruction. (laughs) He outranks us. Maybe you need to take a break. Let me talk to pastors. I am so honored to find out how many pastors are streaming our service. Is this this camera on? Pastor, I get it. Ministry is hard. It's demanding. It is draining. And the devil will attack you and your wife and your children. If you have been serving for year after year after year and you have not taken a sabbatical, do it. Do it. Hear me. The devil is after all. I get it. You need to do that. You are better for it. Your church will be better for it. Peter Scazzaro's wife says, I feel like I am married to four different men, all of them named Peter Scazzaro, because every time he does this and comes back, he's a better man. And the church says he's a better pastor. When he comes back, guess what? He has all new vision and flame. It's like Moses' face glowing coming down from the mountain because he's been alone with God. Maybe you need to do that. So here's what we're going to do. 
Here's my challenge, okay? We've got this rope. God the Father is walking by, just like he did on the mountainside when he hit him in the cleft of the, of the cliff so he couldn't see his whole glory because it would kill him. And he's offering you a rope today. He's offering you a rope, a lifeline from the blizzard. Are you going to grab it? Are you going, like me, because I'm bad at this, are you going to say, draw a line in the sand and say, no more. No more am I going to let Satan steal my blessing. No more am I going to let him rob me and my family of honoring a day of rest as unto the Lord. I'm done chasing the rat race. I'm done being on that stupid gerbil wheel all the time. I'm done. I don't have to ask anyone's permission. I got permission from a heavenly father. Every seven days to declare this is a no-go zone. Negative ghost rider, the pattern is full. God has given you permission. You don't need anyone else's. You got to protect that. Will you reach out and grab that lifeline? As I said last Wednesday night, if we're too busy to slow down and enjoy being with our creator, we are flat out too busy. Shame on us. Shame on me. Thankfully, God is not a God of shame. And he comes and he lifts that. And he says, come to me and I will lift that burden. But you have to come to me. Will you do that? Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you right now. Would you just bow with me? Close your eyes. Just reach out to the Creator. Father, I pray, everyone in the sound of my voice, that we would grab hold of your rope in this blizzard of life. We need you. And the idea of stopping for 24 hours, even if half of it is sleep, just seems so, how do we do that? So impractical. Will you show us the way? Thank you for these four principles we can glean from your word. God, help us to stop, to rest, to delight, to contemplate how awesome you are. And then to model that for our children. To show them what is truly important. It's not the rat race. It's not getting ahead. It's not finishing the to-do list. It's being with you. It's loving you. And I know it's going to require some change. God, would you give us grace to do that? Help us to protect it jealously. To turn off the phone, to turn off the computer, to turn off the devices and just turn into you. To hug our kids a little tighter. To smile, to laugh, to play and delight. Simply because you said we needed it. God, set us free. Set us free to reorient our life around you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.